swing arms uh, move at the launch pad, they all move at once. Uh, this movie you saw, they move sort of sequentially in some odd way. Uh, I don't know why they did that, but I guess it was another one they missed. Uh, there was a lot of noise, there is a lot of noise in the launch uh, of the engines. Uh, I know people uh, feel the engine, I've been there, and feel, feel the shock waves on you uh, several miles away. Uh, we have, don't hear any of that happening. Uh, uh, you hear the suit, uh, suit pants uh, running, uh, putting the air through your hoses to your uh, suits. And as you're going up here, you can hear the hissing as the relief valve uh, lets the uh, air out of the cabin to drop it down to 5 psi on the, uh, the way up. They grossly uh, exaggerated the staging there. It is uh, a very uh, pronounced uh, thing when the uh, main engines uh, shut down in the first stage. It's very abrupt. We're at more than half feet and then nothing. Uh, you tend that the beam thrown forward strapped in very tight, so you don't actually move. Uh, I like in the film, they have them slamming in the instrument panel. And of course, when you finish the engine, the S2 starts off, even though it's got five engines, uh, they're smaller, half a half million pounds thrust each, so you've got a million and a half uh, between them. Uh, but again, that vehicle's fully loaded at that point, so the initial discoloration, uh, which you feel, is uh, a lot smaller than the end shown in the movie. Uh, we did lose the uh, center engine on the S2 stage about two minutes early on the flight due to a phenomenon called POCO, uh, which is a uh, fluid instability in the feed lines to the engine. It actually happened before on uh, uh, previous flights, an eight had a little POCO, and it was actually a major POCO incident, I think on the second S uh, uh, rocket that flew. Uh, and then look through a lot of gyrations uh, getting in the orbit on that uh, flight. Uh, but at any rate, uh, for us, it was just a brief, brief vibration, kind of like a hold it on, feel like a hold up a jackhammer, and it only happened a couple of seconds and went away. Uh, it actually was a very fortunate thing, the engine shut down. It, it obviously uh, had a pressure chamber drop, which the auto sequence picked up, and it on, on purpose shut down that engine. Uh, I was told that, uh, that would actually, uh, with that kind of a pogo, there was going to be structural deformation with the cruciform structure for that center engine that if it had gone much further, it might have burst uh, hell or oxidized alliance and would have had a much bigger problem. So it was very good that engine shut down when it did. Uh, I, w I was uh, uh, cast in this movie as a uh, cutout or a comedian. They said I played jokes as I did occasionally. Uh, I think Bill Paxton overdid it a little bit. And, uh, uh, the docking uh, was again one of those things they dramatized again, like everybody was worried Jack couldn't pull that off. Uh, the dock, docking maneuver from the piloting standpoint is uh, a very easy thing to do. Uh, in fact, the command object pilots kind of ran a running competition through the whole program as to which command object pilot could do it but using the less amount of fuel. So that was the kind of thing that went, went on from those, those fellows. Um, Getting get to the finale here where the explosion happened, <coughs> that, everything was pretty close in terms of the, uh, you saw the lights on the uh, caution warning lights, we did have a large number of uh, lights on. Uh, we had a little sound at the time of the explosion. Uh, we're in the metal hulls, so both vehicles, uh, and when that happened, they, the ringing uh, through the structure of the vehicles. There was motion in the vehicle, but not to the extent uh, pictured in the movie. Uh, when that panel blew off, the water reserve service module had imparted a car uh, to that vehicle differentially from the lunar module. And I actually, the level was on its way into the uh, drifting up into the uh, command module when this happened. And as I went into the tunnel, uh, I noticed the metal was actually crinkled, uh, buckled a little bit in that tunnel area, but it was a proportion uh, between the two vehicles. Uh, but very, very quickly, though, that damped out uh, after a few cycles and uh, everything was uh, normal in that respect. Uh, we did have control problems. Uh, the vehicle was still moving, though, slowly. 
because uh, what had happened, the shock of the explosion had closed valves that had been open uh, and were closed by that shock of the explosion. These were Parker valves that were in our RCS system and in our cryogenic federal system in the spacecraft. The way they uh, functioned is you had a rocker switch on your panel that was spring-loaded to a center position. So if you wanted to open the valve, you sort of open, toggle it to open. If you looked on your panel and you'd get little talkbacks, uh, in the case of a great symbol that would say the valve open. And if you toggled it down, it would close, it would give you horror poles to indicate the valve had closed. And then it switch would spring back to the center. We only used electric power to move the state of the valve, and then the springs held it in place. And that G-shock overcame the spring tension. And what had happened that, that really was tricky was our talkbacks in the spacecraft only were an indication from the switch motion over the boat, not the state of the valves. Now, fortunately, a mission control had telemetry that had the actual position of the valves. So we were faked out a little bit there because we looked and the valves were open. For us, they seemed to be open, but they had actually closed the system. So that caused a number of these lights in the RCS system to survive. Uh, that were really, I'll call it false lights, and just because it's now said to move. The uh, mission control eventually had its recycle thing, a number of those lights went away. The real problem was the one we lost the uh, head explosion in tank two, an oxygen tank. And of course, uh, that, brought, that became sequential with further problems because it somehow, and we really don't know how, it caused the leak either the inner connecting line where we can transfer between the two tanks, tank one, the other oxygen tank we had, or shrapnel from that hit the tank, caused the ding and hit us. But it very slowly, and gradually, uh, we lost uh, both oxygen tanks. Uh, there was confusion uh, for a while because of the, uh, like I said, the, the number of lights on and various systems did not make sense uh, because they were different systems and in no spacecraft uh, the systems were very stove-like or isolated. Uh, there was no, uh, they were not integrated since a lot of systems are the made here. There's no reason that we had this oxygen tank uh, go in the environmental system that it should affect the RCS system. It made no sense at all to us and obviously it should control. Uh, for about 18 minutes, we did not feel here the bank uh, they thought it was really uh, some, uh, some electronics in the caution warning assembly that had failed and was causing these lights. So they really still felt for a while we could work around this as we go on and take information. The Jim Lovell at one point reported he saw some, uh, he turned to a point, I guess, the sun was shining on the leak coming out of the second tank. He saw the material shrinking away and reported that. And at that point, the control. Uh, we weren't all quiet, so we had a real problem with it. From there, we, we went into troubleshooting uh, for a while uh, to try desperately to save that second tank. And uh, it was interesting listening to the uh, loops in the room, which I didn't obviously get to hear it sometime later after we landed. Uh, uh, really, I, I'll say that uh, incredible job done by the command module. Uh, part of the team because they, they were feverishly uh, troubleshooting. They given us uh, commands to try to stop the leak, including eventually shutting off the reactor valves to kill a fuel cell. Uh, they thought the leak might be through a fuel cell. <coughs> really, but they're reversing it. Uh, I think we can do that. In fact, I when they asked me to shut the reactor valves, I asked them to do it. Uh, the name rank of silver. And uh, they finally got to a point that they knew they'd lost the day. And the other people died. And they were listening to the voices I could hear the reflection and the motion in their voices when they got to that point. And now the big problem was how to shut this thing off. They had to get it shut off and start to eat them to our entry batteries, uh, take away energy out of those. And there was no procedure. Nothing existed how to shut off the ship. It was never supposed to be shut off the flight. So they had to completely add in the steps for us uh, to get it gracefully uh, shut down. So that sometime later, it turned out about four days later, we could start it back up. Again, with another procedure, they had to go off and invent. Because there was no procedure about to turn this thing on. Uh, so that was, the, that was some interesting uh, times for that period. Uh, turning on the web was easier. Uh, we did it rather rapidly. But 
We had the land activation checklist. We had all the steps. And it was a matter of working through that book and etching out to use our pens and we skip the things that we knew we didn't need, like DHS radios or uh, rendezvous radar or our landing radar. We weren't, we weren't going to do any of that stuff, so we just skipped those parts of the book and put big X's through and stepped through that procedure. Anyway, I guess we can.